Picture the land around any given interstate exit, the massive concrete overpasses, the bowtie loop-de-loops of on-and-off ramps. In California, the agency that maintains the land around our highways is the California Department of Transportation, or Caltrans. In 2017, Caltrans counted 7,000 homeless encampments next to California roads. Okay, now zoom in on one of these encampments in Berkeley, California, off of Interstate 80 at the university exit. There are about 70 people living there, scattered around in tents and makeshift structures. For years now, Caltrans has been posting notices for the people camped at this exit to vacate. And every couple of weeks, they attempt to enforce the notices by coming in with police and cleaning crews and confiscating any belongings people can't pack up and move in time. It's always incredibly stressful for the people who live there. We gotta break down his house. That's important. You break down the house. Can you move that out the way? Don't yell at him. He doesn't need to move it out the way. He needs to get his house. And then, after the police and Caltrans maintenance crews leave, the homeless campers take the belongings they've salvaged and move right back to the same spots they were in before. A couple weeks later, Caltrans comes again, over and over, rinse and repeat. One of the people living in this encampment in Berkeley is Kate Cody, who goes by her initials, KC. I met KC last year in October, when it was starting to get chilly. The listeners don't know, this is a very misty and and, and cold day. It would be almost, you know... Yeah, it's foggy, huh? Yeah. KC has long silver hair, so bright it almost looks like platinum blonde, and narrow, kind of mischievous eyes. You could mistake her for a hippie, but she's surlier than most. She wears a leather overcoat. She sometimes growls at people. She'll read any book she can get her hands on. I, I really can't go to sleep without them. You know? And I, I, now I've gotten past, well past the point where I fall asleep with a book on my nose and break my glasses. <laughs> the last time Caltrans came through for a sweep of the encampment, a bunch of Casey's belongings were thrown into a dump truck. But she saved some precious items. And when you lost all your stuff... From when Caltrans did they get books or? Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> they were buried in with the beads. She saved her books and her beads. Casey makes beaded jewelry that she sells in an Etsy store. But Caltrans threw away her tent and her bed. For a couple weeks after that, she slept under a cast aside boat sail. Now she has a new tent, which she's set up on the shoulder of the off ramp right next to the stop sign. And she'd like to be left alone. Do you think that the city should, like, that anyone has the right to camp if they don't No, have? but they, they, to a, they, all we want to know is we don't want to break the law. But we have to live someplace and have to sleep one place. Just like, I need to live. And what were Casey's options besides living in a tent next to the highway? She seemed to feel that renting her own apartment in Berkeley was completely out of reach. You know, they're, 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 renting, they're, they're renting not apartments, they're not bedrooms, Beds for twelve hundred a month near the college, twelve. That's outrageous. Casey had about nine hundred dollars a month coming in through Social Security, and it did seem unlikely given her age, sixty six, and the fact that she can only walk very slowly using a walker, that she was going to be able to get a job to increase her income. She tried staying in shelters, but hated the lack of privacy. I just can't. I cannot handle that at all. Plus, most shelters don't allow pets, and Casey has a scraggly little black-and-white dog named Eva who rarely leaves her side. But there was still another option. Casey has a son named Lonnie who lives in the mountains of Colorado. The two of them were estranged for most of their lives, for complicated reasons that I don't fully understand. But about five years ago, they reunited, and they really care about each other. Lonnie doesn't have much money either, but he told his mom, move here to my town and I'll help you. It's cheap here. We'll get you a place and you can stay at my house until you find your own. But so far, Casey hasn't taken Lonnie up on his offer to come live in Colorado. I really hate it. I'm not playing about hating the cold. I really hate the cold. (laughs) If I never see a snowflake again in my life, I'll be so happy. (laughs) I think a lot of people would be surprised that you wouldn't take... Why? Should I take advantage of it? <laughs> we, we were forced apart for a lifetime. I was slowly reconnecting, okay? And if I moved to, to a very small town in Colorado, 
brand new no one. We don't know each other well enough yet. Casey told me that she thought of Lonnie as an escape hatch, but if she wouldn't use her escape hatch to escape the constant sweeps by Caltrans or the difficulty of living 10 feet from a busy interstate off-ramp, it was hard for me to imagine when she would use it. You said he's an escape hatch, and so I was trying to figure out the situation in which you might use your escape hatch. I don't know. I really don't. I just... You just like knowing it's there? Yeah. Yeah. Like knowing he's there. When Casey and I had this conversation, I didn't think anyone would live in a tent by an interstate if they had another option. But it's more complicated than that. What I came to believe is that, in general, people are where they are, not necessarily because they literally have no other choice, although for some that is the case. But because like any human making a decision, they weighed out the choices, and a tent by the side of the road seemed the least bad. I think it's why you do occasionally hear people say, I chose to be out here, which, by the way, you do hear sometimes. I believe what people mean is, I chose this off a short list of lousy options. But there's still agency in that, and agency is precious. In any case, for KC, the encampment was the best of the lousy options, for reasons I was just beginning to understand. In fact, for KC, what the camp provided to her was so important that even when she was found to be vulnerable enough to make it to the top of the list and be offered a new way out, it would be hard for her to accept it. This is According to Need, Chapter 5. Casey is kind of a tough guy, but it's a toughness that covers up a lot of trauma. I get emotional. I get, I get, I cry about everything. I've seen you. Happy? Yes, I know. I, I just, and I feel very bad because then, then it's like you know, blew my cover. <laughs> What's your cover? Tough. I guess I don't know. Casey grew up in New Jersey and ran away from home as a teenager, leaving behind a mother that she says was abusive. I ruined my mother's life because I was born, Casey told me once. But mostly she just can't talk about her mom at all. As a young adult, Casey made her way out to California. She's done some hard living. She was stabbed once. She spent some time in prison. She was addicted to heroin, although she hasn't used in seven years. I'm still a junkie. That doesn't change. It's a physical thing. It doesn't change. And all I have to do is three days in a row, and there I am, you know? For much of her life, Casey had steady housing and income as an in-home health aide. But she's no stranger to unconventional living situations, and to some degree, she's welcomed them. She's lived in warehouses and school buses, and for a long time, she lived in a community of people that built little wooden shacks on top of an old landfill right next to the bay. Don't picture a dump, though. There were some chunks of concrete and rebar scattered around, but this landfill had mostly been covered over with crabgrass, and from its windy shores, you could watch the sun setting behind the Golden Gate Bridge. Casey was kind of a queen bee among the landfillians, as they called themselves. Her neighbors respected her, and she felt like she had a role there. I found a film from that time on YouTube. It's less than 10 years old, but Casey looks so much younger and healthier. Her cheeks are plump and rosy, and she's moving around easily as she cooks a big meal for everyone in the outdoor kitchen. I had taken the chicken, the chicken breast fillets, and I pounded them out and stuffed them with cornbread and, and sausage stuffing, and I'm baking them, and I serve them with a white gravy and salad. In this clip, she was making food for a birthday party they were throwing for Chompy, one of the landfill's many dogs. After the city of Albany forced the landfillians to leave in 2014, The land was turned into a park that Bay Area residents know as the Albany Bulb. And Casey moved into a broken-down RV where she stayed a few years. 
But eventually she had to leave there too, which is when she moved to the encampment in Berkeley next to I-80 where I met her. Some of her old friends from the landfill were already living there, so it felt safe. The landfill loomed so large in Casey's mind that I sometimes felt like, even though she was in a considerably worse situation now, part of her was still there, or still looking for what she had there. But where that place had been quiet and peaceful, now Casey lived five feet from a stop sign, so close to the road that the drivers could easily see inside. And the spot was prone to flooding in the rainy season, which had arrived. It's November, it's cold and damp and raining, and Casey is sick inside of her tent. You're feeling really bad? Yeah. I'm sorry. It suddenly got so cold and so yeah. wet. Just outside, Casey's neighbor Sarah is trying to make sure Casey's tent doesn't flood from all the rain. Sarah's tent is up on wooden pallets so that the water can drain under it, but Casey's isn't. Why is it draining to the tent? Hey. Hi. Are you trying to get the water to flow? Down to the road. Last year when it was raining, this turned into a, it was a lake. I mean, literally a lake. Even if Casey wasn't sick, she'd need help getting pallets. Her mobility just isn't good enough to do this kind of chore on her own. So she relies on people like Sarah for help. I'm frustrated. I can't feel my fingers. It's just difficult. It's just a difficult day. Sarah goes inside of her tent to talk to her boyfriend, Zach. Casey needs pallets, and she's sick and also needs water, she tells him. And you need to go get it. Zach is smoking something, I don't know what, but not a cigarette. And he's not interested in helping right now. No, Zach, save it. You're, you're, no, just admit that you're just a douchebag. You have no manners. Now you won't help Casey get water. You want me to do it, as I'm digging a ditch to save her tent. Sarah and Zach continue to fight, and then finally Sarah says, that's it, she's had it with the whole thing. She doesn't finish digging the ditch, doesn't go get Casey pallets or water. She just goes to another part of the encampment, to someone else's tent, to decompress. I'm sorry, you guys. I can't do this. I'm about to leave. I thought a lot about this interaction afterwards, how a normal, everyday thing for most of us, like rain, can turn into a crisis in the camp. These little crises happen constantly. It means that everyone is stressed all the time and people fight, and sometimes even people with good intentions, like Sarah, just don't have the bandwidth to do what needs to be done. Researchers have actually studied this, the way stress and scarcity erode our ability to make good decisions and solve problems. It's a thing. Still, eventually someone will get Casey water. If her tent floods, someone will help. Casey depends on her neighbors and the encampment for everything. Neighbors run to the store for her and bring her food. Her friend Sid cleans her tent for her. Sometimes it's just friends being friends. Other times she barters with people. It's hard for Casey to get rid of her own garbage, for example. The guy who comes to pick up my recycling takes my garbage with him. It's a deal we have. <laughs> it is. It's a deal yeah. we have. What, what, what does he get out of the deal? He gets the recycling. Oh, he gets, like, your cans and stuff. Yep. Yeah. Look, I don't want to romanticize encampments. They're hard places to live. People sometimes steal from each other and fight. But they also share resources and look out for each other. Encampments definitely are communities. A few weeks after we met, Casey told me a social worker had been out to the camp to give her an assessment for the coordinated entry system. Or, in other words, get her on the list. And did she tell you when she, you could expect to hear anything? She said, you know, where, where I stood on the list by Tuesday or Wednesday, so... Wow, okay. I didn't know then, but of course I know now, that the list isn't a waiting list, but a ranking system. It's a list of thousands of homeless people in the county sorted according to their score on a vulnerability assessment. There were a number of things about Casey that made it likely she'd end up toward the top of the list. For the last several years, she'd been moving into increasingly dangerous and difficult living conditions. Until finally, she had ended up where she was now, just feet from a busy interstate off-ramp. 
Her body was worn down and injured from a lifetime of hard living and a decade of homelessness. Along the way, she'd accumulated many so-called vulnerabilities. A criminal record, a history of drug abuse, an injured knee that meant she could barely walk. There were other vulnerabilities, too. So many that Casey did, indeed, become one of the handful of people at the top of the list in Alameda County. Do you have AC in here? Yeah, do you want me to turn it on? Yeah, can we do that instead of windows just for the um, sound? I'm riding around in the car with Makun Raguram while he runs errands. Makund is a caseworker at Casey's doctor's office, a place called Lifelong Medical Care. 600 feet, turn right onto 41st Street. Lifelong Medical Care recently decided to dip its toes into the world of housing because they realized that in many cases, they couldn't address their homeless patients' health concerns without first addressing their housing concerns. If a lifelong patient needs housing, McCoon can help make sure that person gets into the coordinated entry system. But then he just has to hope they make it to the top of the list. They don't always, even people in really difficult circumstances, which is frustrating. I am frustrated because I have a, a patient with Parkinson's who is sleeping outside right now, and he's not eligible for any permanent supportive housing. KC, though, she had moved so far up the list that she was eligible for that rare and coveted intervention, permanent supportive housing. The permanent part means that Casey can keep it forever, and the supportive part means that in addition to the housing subsidy, she'll get a bunch of extra help, access to things like therapy or in-home care, and a caseworker who's helping her navigate everything. Are you guys working with anyone else that lives in Casey's encampment? I'm not personally. Yeah. It feels like a lot of people there could potentially use one of these permanent supportive housing vouchers. Permanent supportive housing vouchers are expensive, in the range of about $30,000 a year per person. And there aren't enough for everyone, which is why only a few hundred people at the top of the list in Alameda County will get one of these every year. But to actually get the voucher, McCoon will have to submit tons of paperwork and actual proof that Casey is chronically homeless, meaning she's disabled and she's been homeless for a long time. You have to provide monthly evidence of interaction with a person. In cases where there isn't a paper trail documenting someone's homelessness over the years, McCoon will occasionally have to gather witness statements. I can tell you right now, I've been around lousy caseworkers while doing this reporting who I would not want representing me in this laborious paperwork effort. But McCoond is not that. McCoond is young and he looks it, but I still found him intimidating to interview. He's completely impervious to charming reporters and other needless distractions. It seemed like KC was in good hands. But even beyond all the paperwork, there would be one final hurdle— actually finding a place for her to live. It's really hard to to find a decent place in Berkeley with a voucher. If you do find a place in Berkeley with a voucher, they tend not to be the nicest places. But Berkeley was the only place Casey wanted to be. There it goes. One bedroom rent includes utilities, water, electricity, gas, and trash, and internet. There's a washing machine and dryer. One day, shortly after she found out she had been matched with a housing voucher, I stopped by Casey's tent and found her looking at Craigslist. Casey hadn't looked at apartments for a long time, but the voucher she was matched with could be used to rent an apartment on the private market. And does it say anything about vouchers? No, it doesn't. Yeah. A lot of landlords don't accept housing vouchers, although it's illegal not to, so they don't come right out and say it on Craigslist. In any case, pickings are slim in Berkeley. Lots of places in the way of Venetia. Would you ever consider that? Well, I, feel, oh, I, I have no support system there. I have no, no friends, no, no, no help. Yeah. Not only did Casey not want to move to Colorado, she didn't want to move to the relatively close cities of Vallejo or Benicia. She wanted to stay in Berkeley, as close to the encampment as possible. 
Casey had been homeless for close to a decade, which was probably what helped her get to the top of the list. But it was also, in a way, what would make it hard for her to actually get inside. For years, she had been depending on the people around her for support. And moving into housing would mean leaving them behind. Still, sometimes with Casey, I had trouble understanding if, by insisting on staying in Berkeley, she was being prudent or obstinate or both. I mean, do you ever, like... I'm back in the car with McCoond, trying to get out an awkward question. When someone is, is, is unhappy like that, do you ever feel like they're being... They're being too picky. I think it's natural to feel that sometimes. I think, like, potentially people that listen to this could think, like, well, I can't afford to live in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Like, I had to leave Berkeley because I couldn't afford it. Like, yeah. why should someone insist on staying in this really expensive yeah. place? I think the answer is you can have your preferences and... Casey has her preferences. And also, I'm, when, we're, when we're talking about listeners who are like, I want to live in Berkeley, I mean, you too can live in Berkeley if you are homeless for five to six years <laughs> and are lucky enough to get matched up with one of these vouchers. Like, yeah, you'd be my guest. <laughs> Point taken. Right. Like, this, this is not the kind of opportunity that, that you live a happy life and still receive. But it turned out maybe Casey wouldn't have to leave Berkeley to move indoors. McCoond had another option. He'd found an apartment that he thought could work for Casey in a place called the Amistad House. It's a building for seniors and disabled adults. And if they could get all the paperwork together, Casey could get what's called a project-based voucher. Meaning the voucher was still permanent, but it would stay with the building. So if she decided to leave that place, she'd lose it. That was a downside. But McCoon said the building was beautiful and well-maintained. And best of all for Casey, it was in Berkeley. The next time I see Casey, she's in her tent, sitting slouched on her bed with a bunch of tarot cards spread out in front of her. She looks worried, and she says she has reservations about the Amistad. So tell me what your reservations are about the... Oh, I just think I, my, my music is too loud. I'm too loud. <laughs> but you're going to try it? I know, yeah, I don't know who will try it. That, that means I'll be back out here again. Because you think, like, you might get kicked out of there? Is that what your worry is? Yeah, always. Always. Have you gotten kicked out of other places for being the wrong kind of tenant? No, because I never lived in those kind of places. I just can't see me doing the things I want to do. And you don't feel willing to kind of adjust your lifestyle to this new place? Adjust my lifestyle? You mean change who I am and what I do? I don't think I can do that. Well, just not change who you are, but maybe change the, level, the volume at which you play your music or something like that. That's not a problem. That, that, that's not a here nor there. Casey seemed worried that her lifestyle wasn't going to be a good fit for the Amistad. But really, 90% of the time when I stop by her tent to see her, she's just sitting in it alone, reading, not partying or playing loud music or anything like that. To me, it seemed like she was scared, coming up with the reasons it wasn't going to work, breaking up with them before they could break up with her. But it worried me. I didn't know if McCoon would be able to find her another apartment in Berkeley, if not this one, or if she would ever agree to leave this hard place she thought of as home. Casey? Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Do you, do you mind if I come in for a minute? A couple weeks after Casey first told me she wasn't sure she wanted to move into the Amistad, I stopped by her tent to see if her feelings had changed at all. She said that McCoon had been able to calm some of her fears. So he was reassuring? Yeah. What did he say about it? Well, they, they, they want someone to help me get this thing running so I wouldn't have to be stuck 
inside space all the time. Casey has an electric wheelchair, but someone stole the battery out of it, and it hasn't been functional for a while. I think it's hard for Casey to be as dependent as she is on other people, and she's emotional as she talks about it. So he said you guys would try to get your wheelchair running so that you could feel like you could come and go? And, uh... I wouldn't be without support. This is damp and cold and uncomfortable and all that. At least I have friends and support. This place is damp and cold and uncomfortable, but at least I have friends and support. This reminds me of one of my early conversations with Casey. She told me solving homelessness felt complicated. I really do. I, I admire anybody who rolls up their sleeves and decides to take that job on. I really do. What strikes you as being so complicated about it? Like, is it... Finding housing for men, then the people who can't, who just... There, there are people out there who mentally cannot be alone. They can't. They survive in our homeless communities because we make room for them and make sure they go all right. Casey went on to give me an example. She said there was a guy at the landfill named Sparky. He was reclusive and, Casey thought, likely dealing with schizophrenia. But there were a few people in the community who looked out for him, including her. He would sometimes come into her house wet and cold, and she'd have a pair of pants for him and clean socks. You can't, you can't just discard people because, look, if you have a set of priceless dishes and one plate has a fine hairline crack in it, and you know that, that you don't give that to just anybody sitting at the table. You don't send it to the kids' table, you know. You, take that, you always end up with that plate because you're the one who knows not to hit it too hard with your knife or not to drop the fork in it because even though that plate is flawed, that plate is part of the set, right? Okay. And that was Sparky? That was Sparky. That was Sparky, but these days it's also KC. Casey survives with a lot of help from the people around her. She needs a lot of care, and she has to be handled somewhat delicately. Fine china with a crack in it is a pretty good metaphor for vulnerability. The intervention that works for people who need a lot of extra care, people like Sparky and Casey, is fortunately the exact one Casey was matched up with. Permanent supportive housing with no sobriety tests, no barriers. It's the approach that Sam Samberas developed all those years ago in New York and that McCoond is now carrying on here in Berkeley. And it works. In Alameda County, when people are lucky enough to be unlucky enough to get this type of housing, the data shows they hold on to it for a long time. Hello. Hello. Hi, Casey. Hi. The process of getting KC the apartment at the Amistad was a long one. Lots of paperwork, lots of back and forth between KC and McCoond. And I don't know that there was an exact moment when KC finally decided she was going to accept the place. I think it was more the McCoond inched her there little by little. And now it was finally almost time to move in. Dropping off the check next Wednesday, move in the Monday after that. So uh, I don't think I got a chance to tell you the time. It's at 11 a.m. is when we're signing the lease. Casey was still scared, but she was also excited and genuinely grateful to McCoond. She told me she knew she had not always been easy to work with, but McCoond had stuck by her, steady and patient. Like you're in good hands then. I just wanted to make no. sure that, that you didn't I didn't know it, but from, the, the, from the day I asked you about housing, I was in good hands. I didn't know it then. I do now. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. You're welcome. Me anytime. You're getting less anxious and more happy all the time. It's That's really very good. dangerous. <laughs> McCoon told me that if Casey had turned down the Amistad, there might not have been anywhere for her to live in Berkeley. And then they would have had to talk about what was more important to her, housing or staying close to her community. And maybe Casey would have actually chosen to stay homeless in the encampment. I don't think everyone would make that choice, but I think there's a good chance Casey would have. And McCoon said he would have had to let go of his own feelings about what she should or shouldn't do. Which makes me think about something Sam Sambaris always says when he talks about the work he was doing with Housing First in New York. It was never about the housing. It was always about the choice. 
The only other person I heard had made it to the top of the list for housing while I was reporting on Casey's encampment was a woman who went by the nickname Mama Bear. Like Casey, she also had very limited mobility. And so as Casey heads toward housing, there are at least 70 people still living in her encampment. What do you think about Casey getting housing? I'm glad. I'm talking with Sarah. This is a different Sarah than the one who was trying to get Casey pallets in the rain. This Sarah also lives here in Casey's encampment, and she's an old friend who lived at the landfill. She's mostly happy to see Casey getting some help. She's, you know, limited, handicapped, whatever you want to call it, but she needs housing. So did Mama Bear. She finally got it. Um, I want housing, but I don't need it like they do. Yeah. But I think it would, I think living on the streets at my age, 53, it's going to shorten my life. And does it, like, when you see somebody that you know get housing, like, do you feel just happy or do you feel any, like, jealousy or? I'm 99.9% just happy for him. Mm-hmm. But there's a little tiny sliver of, of it's, it's modest, humble jealousy, but just wistful, more wistfulness, I guess. So yeah. I'm not really a jealous person. But um, every now and then there's somebody who, who is really a challenge as a human being who gets housing. And then, I, then I'm like, why the hell did someone like that get housing? <laughs> but yeah, I know it's rational. Many of the people in this encampment have probably had a vulnerability assessment at some point. Many of them are dealing with challenges like mental or physical illness. Some are struggling with addiction. But the bar is just so high now in Alameda County. You have to be able to check so many boxes to get any help. For the people like Sarah who remain in the encampment, their hope is just to be able to stay here in peace without the constant threat of being swept out by Caltrans and having their belongings confiscated. It's this place, right? Yeah, we'll just... Actually, there's a spot right here. On the day of the lease signing, Casey and Makunda and I drive to the Amistad house together. It's a 60-unit building with the dark wooden shingles that are typical in Berkeley on a quiet, tree-lined street. Casey is wearing her best dress, a black, lacy one that is both old lady classy and a little goth. How are you feeling? Mm. What a nice-looking building. Casey hasn't actually seen the apartment she's going to be moving into yet although she's seen a similar one in the same building. Let's hang out in the lobby until she's ready. We wait in the lobby where there's a couch and a fireplace and a sleepy security guard looking at his phone. Casey seems incredibly nervous. I'm a fainter. <laughs> You're a fainter? Yeah. Are you feeling faint? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't it up. It's just lightheadedness. Put, put your head away. between down a little bit. But you that far. Eventually, Casey is called into the management office, where she signs the lease and a bunch of other papers. And then finally, she gets to see her place. We ride the elevator to the third floor and then make our way down a hallway. Um, It's just the first door on the right, as soon as you go through that second door. Okay, so... The apartment is one bedroom and certainly not fancy, but it's really nice, well-maintained, and it has a balcony that looks into a courtyard full of trees. Fully painted, fresh paint in the unit. Uh, I put brand new granite countertops, appliances. You do have like a garbage disposal. While the building manager lists the amenities, Casey is taking deep breaths and talking to her dog, Eva. When she sees the kitchen, she says, remember when I used to cook? Remember when I used to cook? And I get a tree outside my window. And your patio does overlook the garden area, too. And the tree outside my window. (sighs) Before we leave, the building manager hands Casey a set of keys for her place. And that's it. Casey tries the keys out in the door. They work. And then we take her back to her tent and drop her off. She has a lease now. The place is really hers. But she's not going to stay in it tonight. And maybe by this point, I shouldn't have been surprised by this, but I was. I mean, okay, yeah, the furniture McCoond ordered hasn't arrived yet, but Casey could bring over the bed she has in her tent and just make it work until the furniture gets there. 
The apartment has electricity and hot water and a door that locks. The camp doesn't have any of that. But Casey says, no, 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 she doesn't want her old crummy bed in the new apartment. She wants to start fresh with a new bed. In retrospect, this makes sense. Not just that she doesn't want her old bed, but that she's going to do even this final step on her own terms. For the next few weeks, Casey takes small loads of stuff over to the Amistad. Finally, nearly a month after signing the lease, she sleeps in her new apartment for the first time. But a few days later, when I call to check in, see how it's going, Casey is in tears. She wants to go home, to the encampment, she tells me. So your place doesn't feel like home yet? Nope. There's a bunch of empty cardboard boxes. But then things get better. The other people in the building are friendly to her. They don't seem to find her strange like she feared. She starts therapy, taking advantage of the supportive part of her permanent supportive housing voucher. She finds she loves the luxury of a hot bath whenever she wants it. And probably more important than all of that, friends come from the camp, which is just a couple miles away, to help her set up her place and make it feel like home. After the break, some final thoughts and updates about the people you met in this series. Hey, it's Katie. I thought you all might appreciate a few updates about some of the people you met in this series. It's been nine months since Casey moved into her apartment, and she's doing great. Her son Lonnie came from Colorado to visit for her birthday. It was her first time ever being able to host him. And you guys are here, and your mom has a house. Yes, housed. Yay! Yay, yes. roof over her head. Ooh. And it's a pretty place. Isn't it nice, yeah, that yeah. balcony? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Casey. Happy birthday to you. And many more. And many more. You want to blow them out? A lot has happened back at Casey's old encampment, too. The people living there decided next time Caltrans crews asked them to move, they weren't going to comply. Instead of grabbing all their stuff and moving like they always did, the plan was to stay put in their tents. I have some tape of the day they decided to try this. Caltrans workers had arrived at the encampment in a procession of dump trucks accompanied by the highway patrol. And the residents of the encampment were in a kind of standoff with them. Hey, Usha. What's going on over here right now? Uh, I don't know. I was standing with Osha Newman, an 80-year-old lawyer who's advocated for the rights of homeless people in Berkeley for decades. He's known Casey since her days living at the landfill. Back when everyone was forced to leave that community, Osha was there helping them fight to stay. Over the years, he's watched these encampment sweeps and evictions countless times. Are there always this many uh, of them? Of the Caltrans people and the highway patrol people? There are always this many Caltrans people, yeah. I am thinking they're leaving. They are leaving. They're leaving. I'll be damned. They're leaving. They they aren't going to move people. They're leaving. They, this was bigger than they expected. This is kind of incredible. They're leaving. They're leaving. Oh, my God. Has this never happened before? Oh, my God, never, never before. There's never been resistance. They're leaving. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Tell me why this feels so big to you. Oh, it's incredible. It never has happened before that people have resisted. That the people on the street resisted and won. It just has never happened. They've always moved. Every time they've been pushed around, they've moved, they've moved. 
And this time they won't. But aren't they just going to come back next week? Who knows? Of course. You never have a one victory that's the final. The war is never over completely. The war, in fact, lasted several months. There were meetings and negotiations and ultimately a city council vote. But in the end, the encampment residents basically won. They got Caltrans to stop the sweeps, and they got the city of Berkeley to commit to establishing a sanctioned encampment for them, meaning people would be legally allowed to pitch tents and trash service and restrooms would be provided. So far, the sweeps have stopped, but the plans for a sanctioned encampment seem to have stalled out since the start of the pandemic. Who else? Michael, my neighbor, who lived on the boat. He actually left the boat and moved into a program that he's hoping will eventually get him connected to housing. If you heard the Housing First story, you probably remember me talking about what all housing programs used to look like. The staircase model, where you have to be clean and sober to graduate each next step. That's the type of program Michael is doing now. They still exist, and they're generally led by faith-based organizations and don't receive funding from HUD. Michael is hoping he can stick with it and make it into housing. And lastly, there's Talisha and Jordan. Hi, Katie. I'm Yums. Okay. You talk. Can you say something? Uh Uh-huh, I can't. It's, it's, you could just talk. You could pick it up. There's actually been a pretty big development in Talisha and Jordan's story. Talisha never got help from the system here in Oakland. But something else happened. So eight years ago, before Talisha was even homeless, she put her name on a bunch of wait lists for Section 8. Section 8, or housing choice as it's now called, is a government-subsidized voucher that you can use to rent an apartment on the private market. You don't have to be homeless to get Section 8, just low income. And last December, Talisha found out her name had finally come up on one of those wait lists. So now, since he know and I know this is what we have to do in order to stop being homeless and sleeping in a car and going from house to house to family members and different people. This is what we have to do. But here's the wild part. The Section 8 voucher that Talisha got was for Louisville, Kentucky, a place she had no connection to. She had only put her name on the wait list there because it was one of the few that was open in the whole country. Talisha felt she was completely out of options in Oakland, though, so she decided to leave. I don't know if I can possibly convey how unique and difficult this decision was. Despite the Bay being so expensive, I almost never met homeless people who were thinking about leaving. People in poverty depend intensely on their communities for support. Leaving rarely seems to feel in the realm of possibility. But Talisha had decided she had to try. And we just been talking and thinking about all the stuff we're about to go through and travel and stuff. And Yep. We can't do this anymore. I can't take it because people go put, put us out. I'm tired of people putting us out. Yeah. And so in March of this year, as the coronavirus descended on all of us, Talisha and Jordan started a whole new journey. This recording was made just a couple days before they left. And that's it for now, Katie. See you later. Peace. Say 99. 99. Invisible. Invisible. Here we come. Here we come. Kentucky Louisville. Kentucky Louisville. 48 hours. 48 hours. Our journey starts. Our journey starts. God protect us. <laughs> Not again. Not again? Okay, he don't want to say God protect us from COVID-19. Talisha and Jordan's journey into housing was a harrowing one, and maybe someday I'll tell the whole story in more detail. But I will say that they have their own place now, and they're doing really well. It's incredible the way housing changes people's lives. For me, this new chapter of Talisha and Jordan's story is both happy and sad. 
Oakland has lost a very wonderful pair of people. Talisha had to leave the place where she grew up, where her whole family still lives. And she was only able to do this because she'd been on a Section 8 waiting list for eight years. Eight years! Talisha and Jordan's success in Louisville, Kentucky is far from guaranteed. It'll be hard to start a life in this new place without any real support network. Which is why, for me, the takeaway from Casey and Talisha's stories is the same. We need housing opportunities in the communities where people live. How we get there is honestly a whole different podcast. But one place we can all start, and Bay Area people, I'm looking at you, is to be open and welcoming to low-income housing development in our neighborhoods. Okay, that's it from me. People have been asking what organizations they can give to to support homeless folks in the Bay, and we've put together a list that you can find at 99pi.org need. You can also find all of the chapters of this series there. Be safe, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. This chapter of According to Need was produced by me, Katie Mingle, with associate producer Abby Madon and managing editor Whitney Henry Lester. Roman Mars is the executive producer of According to Need. Invaluable editing from Lisa Pollock, Emmett Fitzgerald, Delaney Hall, Christopher Johnson, Joe Rosenberg, and Roman Mars. Bryson Barnes was our sound engineer. Fact-checking by Amy Gaines. Music by Sean Real. Additional music by Eric Hall. Branding and design by muchmore.io. Kurt Kolstad was our digital director. Additional support from Sophia Klatsker, Vivian Lay, and Chris Berube. Huge thanks to Andrea Henson and Osha Newman, who introduced me to KC, and to Andy Wellspring, who made the film about the landfill called Where Do You Go When It Rains, which I excerpted. Thanks also to Talia husbands Henkin, Marisol Medina Cadena, Johanna Zorn, and Chelsea Miller. This chapter of According to Need is dedicated to the memory of Santa Dearheart. According to Need is a project of 99% Invisible, which is a founding proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Radiotopia.